Let's look at um, let's look at Galatians. No, let me change it. Let's go to let's start off in Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians chapter four. And while we're getting there, so I'm sure y'all have probably heard uh, a lot of different messages and lessons on. Um, the fruits of the Spirit and that kind of stuff. And this is not necessarily just about the fruits of the Spirit, although there's nothing wrong with that, but um, it's more about the emotions that God has and the emotions that we have. And the fruits of the Spirit kind of falls underneath that because the fruits of the Spirit are basically emotions that it lists. But I want us to think about emotions that are kind of ambiguous. They're not good, they're not bad. Like being surprised. You know, that you can have a surprised emotion. You know, you're surprised that something has happened. Not necessarily something bad, not ne necessarily something great, that it's you know, a surprise birthday party or whatever and you didn't know it was coming. But just the emotion of being surprised. That can be good, that can be bad. One thing that God is never is surprised. God is never in heaven going, Wow, I didn't see that one coming. That one really shocked me, right? So being surprised is an emotion that we can have that God doesn't have. And the reason we can have it is because we're not God and we don't know everything. And so you can be surprised because you think you knew something and you were wrong or something happens exactly differently than the way you thought it was going to go. And we say, well, I was shocked. I was surprised, whether that be good or bad, okay? So... There are certain emotions that are not necessarily good or evil. They're just emotions that we have. And there are emotions that God doesn't have because He's all-knowing and being surprised is one of them. And there are also emotions that God has that we have too that we share. And they're not necessarily evil or good. For example, anger. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. And let's pick up in verse 26. Ephesians 4.26 In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. So there's three massive things right there. It doesn't say don't be angry. When Jesus saw that they had turned the courtyard of the temple into basically a market, he got angry. And if you read that story, what, would, what they would do was, um, if you wanted to go to the, to the synagogue or the temple and you wanted to be forgiven of your sins or whatever, then you would have an animal that you would need to sacrifice. And different things called for different sacrifices. So sometimes there was a dove sacrifice, sometimes there was a lamb, a goat, a bull, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and so not everybody had these animals in their backyard. Obviously a lot of people were you know, farming and had livestock, but not everybody had a dove. Not everybody had a lamb. Not everybody had a goat. Not everybody had a bull. So you could go and you could purchase one and then you could go and sacrifice it or you could have the priest sacrifice it. Well, people started to realize, hey, if Ryan's going to sacrifice one of these animals for his family's sins, he's going to go to the temple to do it and give it to the high priest. I'll just set up shop right there at the temple. And when Ryan comes up, I'll sell him one. You know, it's location, 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 right? I mean, these people weren't dumb. They wanted to make money. And so the, the outer courtyard of the temple, instead of it being a holy place where you're supposed to be praying and preparing to enter into sacrifice and forgiveness of sins and that kind of stuff, it was, hey man, how much you want for that turtle dove? Or how much do you want for your goats? And it became a place of wheeling and dealing. And then the people that were there were corrupt. And so they would have weights that were unbalanced. And so they would say, well, it's going to cost you two ounces of gold. And, you know, you would hand me your two ounces of gold and I'd put it on my scales and it wouldn't quite weigh two ounces. And I'd say, well, this is just an ounce and a half. And you're like, no, I checked it at the house before I left. I know it's two ounces. I'm like, well, there you go. Here's the scale. It's, not, it's only an ounce and a half. You owe me another, another half ounce or another shekel or whatever. And so they had uh, corrupt scales to cheat people. And so Jesus knew all this stuff, 
He wasn't surprised. He didn't walk up to the temple courtyard and go, what are y'all doing? Man, I am shocked to see this. So he knew what was happening. He wasn't surprised, but it made him angry, even though he knew he was angry about it. Now, if you read the story, he grabs a whip and he turns over the tables and he starts whipping people, running them out of there. Now, he didn't lose control. He wasn't like freak out mode, like, oh, I can't control myself. I can't control my emotions and I'm just beating you. This was a calculated show of anger on Jesus' part because he knew that if he upset the money makers, if he upset the people that controlled the money outside the temple, that would ensure his death. See, there was plenty of things he could do that would upset the apple cart, but he could get away with it. Uh, There's a lot of things that he would just be called a rebel for. A lot of things he'd be called a uh, heretic for, or heresy. A lot of, a heretic. A lot of things that people would would say about him, but they would say, well, you know, if we we do something to him, the people that follow him, they could start a rebellion, they could start a revolt, there could be a riot, we don't want to do that. We don't want to mess up anything, just, you know, ignore him. Just keep going. But when he started messing with people's wallets and went over there and overturned the tables and started running them out of there, not only did he overturn the tables, but he ran them out of there, shut them down. When that happened, it ensured that Jesus would die if he kept in ministry. They were going to kill him because he'd interfered with their money. But he got angry, and here you are in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 to 27. It doesn't say, do not be angry. Now, everybody in here has been angry at some point. Because we're human. And it's one of the emotions that we have. And there's nothing wrong with being angry. But then the next verse, after verse 26, and your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now there's a lot of us that have been angry, but it didn't make us sin. There's, at times we've been angry and it did make us sin. I think that's probably true to say for everybody in here, myself included. But even when we do it the right way, we get angry, but we bite our tongue, we don't sin, and we still are very guilty a lot of times of verse 27, going to bed while we're still angry. Raise your hand if you've ever been to bed angry. Yeah. It's easy to do, isn't it? Well, I'll just we'll talk about it tomorrow or forget about it. I'll just let it go. But we don't let it go, though, right? I mean, we sit there and stew. If, it's, if we're mad enough, we toss and turn in bed for a few hours. We can't sleep. We get up, we pace the floor, and we're so angry that we don't sleep. So this is telling us right here that it's not wrong to be angry, but we shouldn't let our, angry, our anger make us sin. And if we are angry then you need to address the situation with the person or people you're angry with before you go to bed that night. That's not my opinion. This is what it says. It says, do not give the devil a foothold. Well, how do you give a devil a foothold? Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Because when you let negative emotions start twirling and twirling, they don't stay where they're at. They build. Negative emotions do not get smaller as you stew on them. That's why we call it stewing, right? If you put a pot on the burner and you turn on the burner, it's not going to cool down. It's going to get warmer and warmer until it can get as hot as it can get, and then it's going to boil over. And our emotions are the same way. If we have negative emotions, angry angry emotions, or whatever negative emotion that we're having, if we have those negative emotions and we don't do anything about it other than stew on it and think about it, then it's eventually going to boil over. And it's going to make us do and say things that we shouldn't do. We're going to regret later. It's going to cause, uh, you know, if me and Angie are having an argument and I just let it build up and build up and build up and then finally I just lash out at her. Her feelings are going to be hurt. It's going to be hard to repair that bridge. Well, he hurt my feelings. He didn't have to say that. Well, you're right. If I'd have talked about it three weeks earlier before I was so mad about it I couldn't see straight, it would have been easier to deal with, right? But we let it build up, we let it build up, we let it build up. And that gives the enemy a foothold. Me and Ryan were talking before service about how everybody in ministry, whether you're up here on a drum or out there with the kids or you just deliver coffee, whatever it is, everybody in every area of ministry, in every church in America, all over the world, it's human nature to get burned out, to have too much on you, to have stress, And you get to the point to where you're like, I just quit. I give up. I got too much on me. Well, if you would have told somebody two months ago, hey, 
I need a break from my area of ministry. Just, can I have a month off? Somebody fill in for me? If somebody would have had that conversation two months in advance, instead of just throwing your hands up and being mad at the world, it could have been fixed. But it's our human nature to stew. Well, I'm not going to ask. It's my responsibility. I'm not going to ask him else to do it. I'm not going to ask him out to do it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. And then all of a sudden you're here and you're mad at the world. They don't appreciate me. Nobody's even said some thanks about it. No, not one time have I heard thank you. They don't, they don't appreciate me. Nobody does. Why can't so many other people do it? And that's not just you. That's not just me. That's everybody in America that's working in a church. That's how it is. And we just, and we let it stew and let it build and let it stew and let it build. Most of the time when people leave ministry, well, again, whether it's working the AV or in up here singing or doing what I'm doing tonight, when most people leave their area of ministry because of burnout or stress or too much on them or whatever you want to fill in the blank there, it has been going on for a long time. Nobody gets burned out in 24 hours, right? I mean, there's nobody that walks in and says, you know what, today I'm burned out, I quit. It's a building process. It's a snowball that rolls. And we just let it go, and we don't say anything to anybody, and we don't do anything about it, and we stew on it, and it just builds and builds and builds, and then it boils over, and we're like, I quit! I don't care. I'm out of here. And then we just lay down our responsibility in ministry, and we're so mad, we don't care if it gets picked up or not. All right? So, <clears throat> Ephesians is very clear to be slow to anger. The Bible says to be slow to anger, to not sin while you are angry. And if you, if you go to bed angry and you keep doing that, if you keep letting negative things stay and you don't address them, you don't fix them, you don't, then it eventually the devil will get a foothold. That's kind of scary if you think about it. It doesn't say that, read it again, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Think about that. Not only are you tearing yourself up internally with the negative thoughts and the negative that you're dwelling on, you are giving the devil a foothold. Because you know what he's doing? He's sitting right outside that door right now, and he's just waiting to see who he can slip in on. Boy, he'd love to get me. He'd love to get you. And he just sits there and he waits, and he's like, you know what? I don't think anybody told you thank you. Did anybody tell you thank you for that? I don't think they did. And you're like, yeah, you're right. Nobody's, nobody said thank you for that. Nobody appreciates me, do they? They're right. No, no, nobody appreciates you. You know, if you would leave, then they would appreciate you. Then they would know what they're missing. And you're like, yeah. Yeah. I'll show them. I'll teach them a lesson. The Bible says, not Duncan, the Bible says those thoughts are giving the enemy a foothold. And we've all been guilty of it in the past because we've all gone to bed angry. We've all stewed on something and didn't address it with what we were stewing on. And it gives the devil a foothold. Okay? So we've talked about a couple of emotions that um, we can have that God doesn't have, like being surprised. We've talked about an emotion like anger that we share with God because God can get angry. If you read the Old Testament, many times it says, God was angry. All right? Now, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, mean he doesn't love. You've all been mad at someone you love before, right? You've been angry with them. But even in the heatest, hottest, burning anger that you've had with them, if somebody could hit the pause button and say, do you love them? You would say, yeah. Are you ready to wring their necks? Yes. But I love them, Right? And it's, it's the same way with God. Look, I'm going to spank them. I'm going to wear them out. I'm going to beat them with a switch because I, I love them. They need discipline. And that's, at times in the Old Testament, that's what was happening was God was like, you know what, I've tried everything else. I've sent you prophets. I've sent you my word. I've sent messengers. I've done everything I can do besides put calamity on you. And you won't listen. But because I do love you, I'm going to throw some calamity down on you. And then if you still don't listen, that's going to make me angry. Just think about it if, you know, if there's a kid at your house. Hey, don't do that. And they do it anyways. Don't do that. And they do it anyways. I told you, don't do that. And they do it anyways. 
I was reading uh, James Dobson's book, Dare to Discipline. Or maybe it was Strong Willed Child. Both of them are great books. But I was reading one when Noah was born, or when he was two or three years old. And uh, there was a great story in there. It said, and it really changed the way I viewed some of my parenting. It said, there's a big difference between a kid doing something that they don't know is wrong and something that they are willingly disobeying over. And he said that a lady had written him a letter one time at Focus on the Family, and she said, my three-year-old or two-year-old, whatever it was, real young toddler, little girl had gotten a magic marker and went into their dining room where they had this real expensive piano, and she wrote all over the piano, and it wouldn't come off. It ruined the finish. And she said, you know, I thought I need a spanker for that. I mean, that's a big no-no. She ruined, you know, a $30,000 piano. And James Dobson said, does she know that it's worth $30,000? <laughs> Can she even fathom what that means? See, to you, it holds high value. To her, it's just something to write on. Looks cool when you put a marker on it. Did you ever tell her not to do it? Well, no, I told her not to write on walls. Well, okay, that's not a wall, right? And he said, see, now, if you, would, if you told her, don't write on this or you will be in trouble, and then she writes on it, she has willingly disobeyed you. That means spanking. If she has no idea and she does it, then you need to instruct her. You don't run out in traffic because you will get ran over and get killed. Right? That kind of stuff. So, God has emotions like anger. We know that He has love. We know that He has compassion. Mentioned many times in, in the Bible. If you look at the fruits of the Spirit, look at Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you study emotions in the Bible, just do a Google search, emotions in the Bible, and you know, it'll pop up a bunch of verses for you. Self-control is in there a bunch. It's in there so much that it'll surprise you. You know, we all think about joy and love and patience and that kind of stuff. But self-control is in there almost every time that all this other stuff is listed. Which I find very interesting because it's kind of a no-brainer that, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, those kind of things. But self-control, you know, that, that's a funny, self-control is a funny thing because self-control means you're doing it yourself. That's hence the definition, self control but it's a fruit of the spirit see on your own on my own left to our own devices we don't have self-control we have to have the holy spirit working through us to have self-control that's why diets fail that's why people work out for three times and then don't work out anymore. That's why people start jogging and stop. That's why people say, I'm going to learn how to play the piano and they take three lessons and stop. Or I'm going to learn how to play the guitar and they buy a guitar and they never get out of their closet. Because it takes self-control and discipline to do all those things. And we don't have it. Now some people, inherently, just in their DNA, are better at it than others. There are people that are disciplined more, can go to the gym more, can go jogging more, can learn an instrument even when their fingers are bleeding. They don't care. They want to learn and they do it every day. But by and large, our human nature is not self-control. Given the choice to eat the chocolate cake or to walk past the chocolate cake, most of us eat the chocolate cake. How many times have you said, well, I'm going to start my diet Monday anyways, right? So... I can have it today. Or I'm going to run really far tomorrow. I mean, like the furthest I've ran in a long time. So today I'm going to eat the whole pizza, right? And we, we kind of convince ourselves that the lack of self-control is okay because I'm going to make up for it later. And the reality is we normally don't make up for it later. And even if we do try to make up for it, we've still done the damage the day before, right? And sin is the same way. Well, I'm going you know, to do better next time. Well, that's great, but you still ruined it this time. All right, so looking at the fruits of the Spirit, if you compare those good, awesome things like love and forgiveness and kindness and gentleness, 
if you compare those things to the bad and negative things, the flip side of the coin to what they produce, the fruits of the Spirit will produce self-control, joy, and peace. To not have those things, you get... Uh, well, let's look at 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter three, verse three. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men or humans, depending on which translation you have? There is quarreling and there is jealousy. This is what is compared in the Bible to being worldly. Quarreling and jealousy. Now, I, would, I think it's safe to say that everybody in here has quarreled with someone in the past. Maybe you're quarreling with somebody right now. Everybody in here has had jealousy. Maybe you're jealous about something right now. But the fruits of the Spirit compared to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is worldly, fruits of the Spirit compared to worldly, what we have to be careful of is if we are not in the fruits of the Spirit and we are experiencing worldly emotions and dealing with those things uh, and, and letting them stew and letting them breed and letting them grow, then we're not going to be fruitful in the Spirit. We're going to be worldly. Another great example is um, uh, Philippians 4.6. Y'all probably can quote Philippians 4.6 by yourself. If you compare uh, Philippians 4.6 to Joshua 1.9. Philippians 4.6 says, and it's all about the peace of God. It's, again, a fruit of the Spirit kind of thing. But Philippians 4.6 says, In everything... Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Do not be anxious about anything. And then look at Joshua 1.9. Do not be anxious about anything. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Think about those two things. Don't be anxious about anything. Well, I've been anxious about stuff before. I've been worried about stuff before. You know, do you realize it is a sin for the Christian to worry? It is. It's a lack of faith. What are we worried about? Not enough money? Well, the, one of the Hebrew names for God is Jehovah Jireh, the provider. He's got it all. You know, when Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, Isaac said, hey, where are we going to get the lamb to sacrifice around here? We don't have anything to sacrifice. And Abraham said, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide a sacrifice. He will, he will provide according to his riches in glory. Well, what are his riches in glory? What does he not own? He could bring the planet Saturn down if he wanted to and could hand it to somebody because he's God. So are we worried about money? I've worried about money before. Are we worried about health? I mean, Jesus is the great physician is what it says, right? It says he's walked into Lazarus' tomb and said, come forth. And after he'd been dead for four days, he walked out of there. And that's not the only person he raised from the dead. He himself raised from the dead. And that's why it says, oh death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? We say those things. We go to a funeral and the preacher tells us how... This person's in heaven and we're all going to get to heaven and not to worry about death. It's not a big deal. And we hear those things, but then we worry about our health, don't we? We get, we get scared sometimes. I mean, if somebody tells me tomorrow I've got cancer, how am I going to handle that? Am I going to be like, oh, well, it says right here to be thankful in all things. Thank you, Lord, for the cancer. Because people go through that every day. Every day they get some bad news medically. So what are we worried about? 
Because Joshua 1 9 says, Be strong, be courageous, do not be terrified, do not be discouraged. You ever been discouraged? Man, I've been discouraged. I have been discouraged. The hardest thing I have ever done is be a pastor. It's hard. I mean, it's hard. Not that I'm pouring out blood, sweat, and tears every day digging ditches. It's not, you know, I'm not talking about blisters on your hand hard. I'm talking about you see the, the darkness of the world every day. You sit down and you talk to people that need counseling or whatever's going on in their lives and you know, they're addicted to drugs, they're, having, they're cheating on their spouse. I mean, you just see the darkness that's in every corner, every nook and cranny. Not many people say, hey, can I sit down and talk to you because I want to tell you how awesome things are going and what God has done in my life. You don't get those phone calls. And I know those things go on, right? And we've all had that mountaintop experience, right? But not one time has anybody called. And look, I'm not saying woe is me. I'm telling you any pastor in the world, they don't get phone calls with people saying, I want to sit down with you and I'll tell you how awesome Jesus is. Now, look, I realize you don't call the police because you want to tell them what a great job they're doing. You call the police because somebody's breaking into your house and you want them to get there as quick as they can. Normally, if you're setting up a meeting with a pastor, it's because you need pastoral stuff. I get that. But my point is, in our walk, your walk, my walk, nobody promises us it's going to be easy. When you pour into people and you love on them and you, you're there for them every time they, you think every time they need something, and then they leave. We're not, going, we're not coming to your church anymore. Well, it's not my church. It's our church. Well, it's not ours anymore. Why not? Well, just because. I mean, that's the hardest thing as a pastor. That's the hardest thing. And you're like, why? What? I don't, I don't understand. And you know, Sometimes it's the, the three-month buildup. Why didn't we have this conversation way back there when we could address some of you, your things here? But nobody said anything. It festered. It brewed. And the Bible says that's giving the devil a stronghold. And so you pour into people and then they're like, you know what? We're gone. It's hurtful. It's discouraging. And you know what? You've been discouraged too before. I am not unique in that. Everybody has been discouraged. And when it hits me, it's hard to grab Joshua and say, well, I'm not going to be discouraged. I'm not going to be terrified. I'm, I'm going to press on. Because the human nature is to do what it says not to do. Human nature is to say, Oh, man, oh, here we go. Woe is me. A little bit of anger builds in. A little bit of discouragement. A little bit of frustration. And we dwell on those negative things. And they build. And they build. And they build. And then if you could just hit the pause button and somebody could jump into your living room and say, Hey, are you living in the fruits of the Spirit? To say yes would be a lie. Because to be honest, you'd have to say, well, actually I'm, I'm pissed off right now. I'm mad at this person over here. I'm angry. Pisses in the Bible, you can say that. <laughs> it is. <laughs> There's a, you know when, um, when Elijah called the fire down from the heavens, he was debating with the priest, the satanic priest, the worshiping Baal. And Elijah says, I tell you what, says, uh, Y'all put some wood over there and uh, put a ditch around it and get it ready to light a fire. And you cry out to, to Baal and you say, burn up this wood. And you pray to him. And then when y'all are done, I'll pray to God. And whoever can set that wood on fire through their prayer, we know they're worshiping the real God. And so the satanic priests go first and they start crying out to him. And it was their tradition to really show what you wanted, that you were really uh, submissive to, to Baal, which was really just Satan, to this false god, Baal. You would cut yourself and bleed. You know, teenagers cut. There's a lot of cutting that happens. Well, that is a satanic practice that goes back to the Old Testament where people would cut themselves to show that they were submissive to their false god, to, to Baal or whatever. And so they would cut themselves to show how much they cared and how, how serious they were. And they'd cry out and they'd pray. And Elijah is toning them and, and, and you know, giving them a fit. And one time he says, maybe he's taking a piss. Maybe he's out pissing against the wall. That's what he says. That's what it says in the Bible. 
And you know, they're like, no, no. And when they're finally done, Elijah says, all right, take buckets of water, pour it all over the wood, surround the trench with the water, and just get it as wet as you can. And they do. And he says, now do it again. I'll do it again. Do it again. And they do it again and again and again. And then he says, all right, God, do your thing. And fire comes down, consumes it, burns up the water in the ditch, consumes the fire. There's nothing but ashes. And everybody goes, whoa, that's the real God. And they kill all the uh, false prophet priests and all that kind of stuff. So, but anyways, that's my piss is in the Bible story. Um, <clears throat> but back, back, let's wrap up here. Back on, on the fruits of the Spirit and the emotions. Um, 1 Corinthians tells us that if we have quarreling and we have jealousy and we start having these negative things and it tells us in Ephesians, if we let those things build, then we're giving Satan a foothold. And then Joshua tells us that when those things are happening to us, when we're feeling those negative, bad emotions, to remember that's not what God intends for us. That's why he says in, in uh, 1.9, and Joshua, he says, have I not commanded you? It's a reminder. See, Joshua had to be reminded. You have to be reminded. And I have to be reminded. Sometimes monthly, sometimes daily, sometimes, depending on what's going on in our life, maybe hourly. But we have to be reminded that God says right here, be strong, be courageous, do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, he doesn't say... It's going to be cupcakes, unicorns, and Skittles everywhere you go. He says, when the crap hits the fan, don't be discouraged. Remember, I've commanded you. I'm going to be with you wherever you go. So don't freak out. Don't worry. Don't panic. Don't give the enemy a foothold. Don't let him start whispering. And you're like, yeah, yeah. I'll show him. Yeah. Yeah. That lady's good. I'm, I'm going to stick it to them. Because it's easy to do at work. It's easy to do at church. It's easy to do with your neighbors. I had a neighbor come up to me the other day. And he said, your dogs have been getting down in, in our yard. And they chased one of my kids today. And this was a couple weeks ago. And I felt awful, you know. And, you know, I apologized and told him we'd do a better job of keeping an eye on our animals and all that kind of stuff. But this guy could have been a real jerk about it, Right? I mean, he, he could have said, I'll show him. Next time he's down here, I'll just shoot that thing. He'd have every right to do so. If your dog's chasing my little kid in the yard and my kid's running around in circles for his life and you shoot it or I shoot your dog, I'm just going to tell the authorities, the dog was chasing my kid in my yard. I thought it was going to bite him. I shot it and killed it. And the authorities would be like, okay. He could have been a real jerk about it, right? He could have stuck it to me. But he didn't. He was nice about it. And so, I don't know if this guy's a Christian or not, but I know Christians that don't handle things that well. I know that I have not handled things that well in the past. I know I wish I had some do-overs on some stuff. You probably do too. Here's what I want to leave you with. If you are dealing with negative, bad emotions, they're not from God. God can't be surprised. God can't be uh, discouraged. God can't be frustrated with progress. He can't be... He can be angry, but He can't hate you. So these negative, bad emotions, according to the Bible, are Satan's foothold. And they're easy to let creep in. Because that's how we're wired. That's human nature. That's why bad news travels a whole lot faster than good news. If something good happens and you find out about it, you're like, when did that happen? Well, about three weeks ago. Something bad happens, it's on Twitter right now. It's on your Facebook and your Instagram two minutes ago. People love bad news. Part of the reason we love bad news is because we like to see bad things happen to other people. He, 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 he. And that's not a fruit of the Spirit either. So if you're dealing with negative, bad emotions and you've allowed Satan to get a foothold on those, now that sounds like, well, I haven't allowed Satan to get a foothold on me, I'll tell you what. Well, if we got negative emotions, that's a satanic foothold. Not according to the first book of opinions, but that's what we just read. Don't allow Satan to get a foothold. 
So let's pray. Lord, we come to you now uh, as a Christian body, Lord. We just pray that if there's somebody in here right now that is dealing with negative things in their life, they're having negative emotions, they're depressed, discouraged, uh, they're mad or angry with someone or some people, Lord, whatever negative is going on in their life, that you would just take that away and replace it with your Holy Spirit, Lord. We just, as Christians right now, kneel before you and say, Lord, we don't want Satan to have a foothold in our lives or my life. We want you to remove the enemy from our lives, bind him up, don't give him any place in our life, Lord. If he's established any footholds in our heart or in our minds, kick him out. Just let your holy presence come in and wash him out of there and replace him and give us a renewed mind and spirit, Lord. And if there's somebody in here or listening to the sound of my voice, Lord, that's not a Christian, we just pray that they would say right now, Lord, come into my heart and save me. I've been dealing with the negative because I don't know you as my Savior and the best way I know how, I ask you to come into my heart and save me. And we ask all these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Duncan Davis at Impact Church. Thank you for listening today. We hope and pray that today's message has impacted your life for Christ. We pray that you'll impact others' lives for Christ. Come and fellowship with us at Impact Church on Sunday mornings at 1030. Have a great day and God bless you.